try. Okay, what should you consider when signing up for and participating in a 401k plan? How do you decide how much to contribute? What's a match and how does it help you? And can you move your 401k? We will answer these questions and more on this episode of Through the Pines. Rex, I am stoked to have you in studio today. What is this? This is crazy. What an awesome Man. setup you have. <laughs> in Thank the you trailer. for having me. Yeah, yeah, let's see. I can even do different swiper rooskies, I think, here. So, like, watch this. I'll just swipe it out. There we go. To the, and then swipe it to the other side. Wow. And we have Rex. All right, then we have a full crew, actually, per usual. We have Dan Nelson and Brandon Smith also with us here on Through the Pines. This is the ultimate 401k how-to. I think that's what we're going to call this. So we will answer all the 401k questions we possibly can. I was told to ask Brandon all the questions. Um, before we get there, like our Facebook page, follow our Instagram, Pines underscore podcast. That's new and so also new our YouTube channel. So if you're not watching this live on YouTube, you can see our wonderful, beautiful faces on YouTube. Uh, get to know what we look like. It's Through the Pines podcast on YouTube. All right, considerations when signing up for and participating in a 401k how much should I save? I think that's the first step, right? Is deciding how much should I save into my 401k or other work sponsored retirement plan. What are the other work sponsored retirement plans? Well, there's, there's a lot. First, thanks for having us. Love being in studio. Sweet. Good. So, Glad you know, you. the last two years we've been virtual completely and, yeah, and finally decided to make it back into the camping trailer Banyan. Yeah. Two, I think we call this. This one's Banyan One. Banyan One. Yeah, Banyan One. <laughs> All right. Uh, two's two. Uh, I'm going to need more money before I can buy Banyan Two. <laughs> okay. That'll be a step up when I want to get that one. But yeah. All right. So, so there's a lot of employer types of employer sponsored retirement plans. Okay. Right. You have simple plans that are kind of a 401k light, if you will. You have 401ks. You have, you know, if it's a, a school district, you have 403bs. If you're a government employee, you may be part of a thrift savings plan. Okay. Um, there's pensions. There's, you know, so so there's a lot. So we're today we're going to focus primarily on um, 401k plans. And and the first thing you need to do instead of deciding, am I going to save or not? The first thing is we need to become eligible for a 401k plan. Yeah. And so what's, well, how does he, how do you become eligible? Well, you have to be hired. <laughs> you need a job. <laughs> <laughs> you need a job. And, and rumor has it that there's two jobs for every one uh, person that's looking right now. So, oh. so everybody should have a job. There's no reason not to be working. I'd jump on that because that might not last forever. That could change. Yeah. That could change with the recession. So, um, so, so you need a job. Most employers have different requirements depending on what they're trying to achieve with their 401k plan. So a lot of employers will have one year of service, meaning you have to be employed for a full 12 months. Um, you, a lot of plans will be over the age of 21 and then typically they'll have an entry date. And so a, a common entry date would be January 1st and July 1st that, you know, if you hit your 12 month mark on March 15th, then you'd have to wait till July 1st of that next year, you know, to, to jump into the plan. And so the, the first part is understanding your eligibility, yeah. making sure that you're eligible for the plan. And, and then once you do that, then you need to learn about the plan and make a decision on, on saving and how much am I going to save and, and all of the questions about the podcast today. I got a question already right off the bat. If you're not 21, what do you recommend? Because your first job, you're excited to get going and you're excited to make money and you want to put money into a, your parents are probably saying, Hey, make sure you participate in your company's 401k match, whatever program. And you're not 21. What do you do? So it's a funny thing that you asked, right? Because <laughs> last month we did a podcast on how to get money into your IRA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, so if you're under the age of 21 or your employer doesn't have a company sponsored plan, you know, then obviously we can use IRA accounts, Roth IRA accounts. You can also go in and talk to your HR department and and voice your your concern. <laughs> say, show them a fake ID and <laughs> well, okay, yeah, like... <laughs> we're, not, we're not getting into a bar. <laughs> okay, okay, and so, but but you can different podcast. <laughs> you can go in and and say, hey, will you talk to the four hundred one k committee or whoever's in charge of making our our plan design and see if they would entertain the idea of allowing employees to get into the plan earlier and, and reducing the age limit from 21 down. And, and they may or may not do that. We've had a number of plans that have done that. 
Um, but we also have a number of plans that that stay strict to the age of 21. So, okay. Uh, all right. So then we, we're going to talk about being able to contribute, right? So I'll, I mean, how do you decide that? You just go, you just, I think originally I, I was like, okay, well, whatever the match is, that's what I got to start with. That was, that was kind of what I had learned historically, traditionally, whatever. And then I thought, but it's only, sometimes it's only 3% and maybe you want to contribute more. So how do you determine how much to contribute? Dan, what's been your advice over the years to, to different, you know, kids of your own and, and people as you've worked with them or, or as they've changed jobs and they started planning? What's, what's been your advice? 10%. You should pay yourself 10%. Um, we talked about a few podcasts ago. Uh, you know, when you when you make a dollar, you really don't make a dollar. You're going to end up with 50 cents on that dollar or maybe 60 cents on that dollar. But 10, 10 cents of that dollar should be in some type of retirement plan. And so it's a pretty easy round number. 10 percent is a pretty easy round number. So if there's if you're possible, if it's possible for you to do that, to save that much. Certainly, that's what you ought to start with and then learn to live on the other money. Dan, just to clarify, you're thinking the entire 10% goes in the 401k or set aside 10% and figure out how to split that up. And some goes in the 401k and some goes somewhere else. Yeah, there could be some after-tax savings as opposed to just pre-tax in a 401k. But uh, but if you have the ability to, to live on 60 cents of the dollar and you know 10% and you can put that in a 401k. And if you can do that early in life and continue to do that and get those matches all through your life, Life is better at 60. <laughs> Life's better <laughs> at 60. Rex, uh, does that sound right? Yeah. So my my advice, especially for for the younger generation that's just getting into 401k plans, has typically been 10 to 15 percent. And and my advice has always been, you know, 10 percent gets you a good retirement, 15 percent typically gets you an amazing retirement. Mm. And and so you know, my my goal typically is start where you can. And, and then do a little bit more. So you're just a little bit uncomfortable. And then we try and get you to 10 to 15% as, as quick as we can reasonably get you there. Sure. And if you're 10 or 15% is more than the allowable or what are the allowable contributions per year? Yes. So so you can actually contribute up to, if you're under age 50, you can contribute up to 20,500 into a 401k. If you're over that age 50, you can contribute $27,000 per year. And so fa- fairly high, you know, contribution limits. I will say too on the contributions, you know, don't let don't let the you know best be the enemy of, of good, right? Um, I can't tell you how often I'm, I do enrollment meetings and people say, "Hey, love it, want to get started. This year money's tight," and and they don't sign up, and that continues on and on and on. And so even if all you can do is three percent, that's vastly better because it's going to make it that much easier to do 4% or 5% next year because you don't get used to spending that money. Not only that, the match, I mean, that match is so powerful. You don't want to give up that money because I mean, that's, we're talking a lot of times it's hundred percent risk-free rate of return on your money overnight as that employer contributes that for you. And so I I would say, you know, ideally 10, 15%, you know, starting young and, and going till older, but man, it, it's almost even more important if you haven't been saving and you're in your forties and your fifties to even just get started. Um, cause it, it makes a, a, a huge difference down the road. Brandon, talk to me about the match and why it's so important to, to understand what that is. And hopefully your company does that and make sure, uh, if they do what is vested and when can you get your match? Yeah. Yeah. And I hear that a lot from people. If a, a 401k plan, you can make a 401k plan without a match. And, and sometimes, you know, people are bitter about it and like, oh man, like what, <laughs> what, what, what's the use? They don't match. It's just a waste of money. Um, but they, they forget and don't realize that the 401k plan is an incredibly powerful savings vehicle. Um, you know, nobody, nobody, I mean, the Roth IRA is, is very powerful, right? It's a very, it's almost a buzzword, right? I, I'm doing a Roth IRA. Roth IRA though, you can only get $6,000 a year if you're under age 50, 7,000 if you're over age 50. And then your cap, the 401k, you can do all Roth if the plan allows it. And most do nowadays. You can do all Roth, you know, do the full 20,500 or the full 27,000 into a Roth 401k. Even without a match, it's incredibly powerful. Now, a lot of 401k plans actually have matches. And what a match is, 
is, is essentially, it means if you save 3% of your income, depending on how the company is structured the match, they may choose to match your contribution with another 3%. Let's say 3% is $300 of your check. And then the company gives another $300 on top of it. And so you can see how, you know, how powerful that becomes. If you invest 300 and the next day you have $600 in your investment account, right? I'm not aware of another, <laughs> another investment that good. Brandon, just to clarify, why, why would a company do that? Just because they're being nice and want to keep employees? Believe it or not, yes, sometimes. Um, but but you bring up a really good point with the safe harbor. Um, 401ks, and this gets more into the company level, you know, the plan design of a 401k, but I think it's worth knowing. Um, a 401k has what's called testing on it each year, meaning that that you the highly compensated employees or, or people making more than $135,000 per year, that's as of 2022, um, if the, high, the highly compensated employees can't save dramatically more than the other employees on a percentage basis. And so, you know, each year you're tested, let's say, you know, the people making more money are saving, you know, 10% or 20% of their income and, and the other employees aren't really saving in into it very much, those highly compensated employees are actually going to get a, a check written to them at the end of the year because they contributed too much and the plan didn't make testing. Now, one, one of the ways around that is to do what's called a safe harbor plan. And one of the major parts of a safe harbor plan is to have matching with it. Mean, and the most com probably the most common one is, is where the employer matches 100% on the first 3% and then 50% on the next 2%, or in other words, if the employee does 5%, the employer matches four. If an employer is willing to just offer that, that match, you know, year over year and, and, and not, <clears throat> and that's just out there for employees and they know they get that match and it's fully vested as soon as they make that contribution, meaning that it's their money to take to another job if, if they need to, um, then, then the plan is, is, doesn't have to go through all those rigid testing requirements. And, and so a lot of times we see employers do that just because then the, you know, it's, it's just really frustrating for any employee to be saving towards retirement. Then at the end of the year, get a check back and say, sorry, you know, you tested out. And so that, yeah. that's kind of one of the most common ones we see. All right. So is that the only con to matching and matching limits or, or what are some of the cons pros and cons to those limits? I mean, the, the, probably the biggest one is, is that you have to actually, you know, contribute, right? That's a substantial <laughs> amount of money for the employer yeah. to, to pay. And, and, and does it help, you know, employees feel loved, wanted, like this is a long-term deal? Absolutely. But it is an expense. And so, you know, if you're an employer and you're thinking, hey, should I start a 401k for whatever reason, whether it's bringing on more talent, retaining employees, or if you just want to have a place where you can save $27,000, tax, you know, tax favored, whatever your reasons are, it's worth running those, you know, looking at payroll and running and saying, all right, what's my, what's my kind of maximum exposure that we think might, might be the case. And, and what's the more likely, how much is this plan going to cost me? Yeah. Do you have a comment, Rex? So I, I think a couple of things, one vesting, um, we get a lot of jargon in this in this industry and vesting is is one of those things a lot of people hear and they don't always know what it means but it's it's a you know it essentially means ownership and so your money vests or becomes yours their money becomes yours over time unless it's immediately vested um and so most most companies some some do safe harbors where their contribution is immediately yours your money is always yours right you put thousand dollars in you leave the company, you can always pull your thousand over into an IRA or your new employer's plan. Their money, if it's a safe harbor contribution, is always yours also. And so then if you leave after a year and you put a thousand in, they put a thousand in, then two thousand dollars goes with you and it would go into an IRA or or what you know, whatever you decide to do with that. If it's vesting, uh, which a lot of companies do, then the most common is over basically a five-year period to where it vests 20% per year over a five-year period. And so I, if you leave in year three and they had put $1,000 in for you, you would take all of your money and 600 of theirs. And that's one of the ways that company incentivize longevity because it it definitely costs money to, to hire, to train, and to retain employees. And so they want to put some things in place that will help you stay with the company. 
and it will benefit you. And so that's one of the reasons that sometimes there's a vesting schedule as, you know, attached to the company's contributions. What is this but, true, true up provision? Oh, sorry, Brandon. I, I, I was just going to say that's the downside too, right? And that's that's why a 401k plan design becomes so fun and there's so many complexities, right? Because you as an employer might say, hey, I want vesting to incentivize people to stay six years with me because the cost of turnover is so high. But then you give up that safe harbor, right? You give up being able to have all employees contribute the maximum amount to the plan. And, and so it really, when you're building a 401k, it's amazing the flexibility flexibility that you have. And you really need to understand, right, what am I trying to accomplish? And, and sometimes it's multiple goals, right? But but ultimately, what am I trying to do? And it's it's really cool how much you can build, you know, in, into these plans. All right. Again, we have financial planners with planwithbaxter.com, Rex, Dan, Brandon with us. Um, so, we're talking about these 401ks from the employee's perspective, but I'm assuming you guys set them up for employers as, as well. We do. We do. So we, we work with employers to determine what the right type of employer sponsored retirement plan would be, whether it's a 401k or some other type of plan or a combination of plans. Um, but then we also work with the employees. So we, we educate, we work with the employees to, to answer their financial questions as they go to enroll and if they have questions on the investment lineup, things things along those lines, as well as our regular clients, they may have 401k plans either at their current employers or past employers. And so frequently we're getting involved to say, okay, what you know, what are the the limits that you can contribute into here? Is it all before tax? Do we have Roth provisions? Do we have after tax provisions, which we'll get into in a little bit? Um, do they have true up provisions, which you had just asked about, and yeah. we'll. We'll, we'll explain what a true up is. Um, and, and so we work with, with employees and, and clients all the time because these are a lot of questions. And, and sometimes employees feel a little bit overwhelmed about all the questions and not knowing what to ask. And so sometimes it's just saying, hey, look, this is, this is the gaps of your plan. And, and employees can have some influence over a plan design. If, if you start to to kind of say, hey, look, you know, I'm I'm a valued key employee, and this is something that would really benefit me. Then bring it up to your management, and and let them evaluate it. And if they decide against it, that's fine. You know, they'll come back and they'll explain to you why they why they aren't including that in your 401k plan. Um, typically, mm -hmm. if they're good managers, right? <laughs> uh, but but and and sometimes they'll 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 make a change at the end of the year and say, yeah, that's great. That's a that's a great idea. Let's include it in our plan. We'll make a change and. And all of a sudden, instead of a, a true up provision, um, you know, we, that we didn't have before, we're going to throw it in. And so, Brandon, do you want to go through a true up? And yeah, up to everybody. Yeah, yeah. True ups are, are, are an important topic that, that are widely not not understood. Um, essentially, for not and, and I hope it's obvious by now, not all 401k plans are, are, are created equal or, or should I say they're all very diverse. And so um, they on on the true up. Some plans have and some don't. And what a true up is, is, is let's say your HR department and your match is 3%. So you're going to match each of your employees' contributions each month by 3%. You do the calculation, you know, so-and-so saved this much. And so we match them 3%. Well, let's say you get, you've got an employee who's really, really, you know, exuberant and really excited to save into his 401k plan. And they're saving. They hit that $27,000 maximum by... October, right? They've funded the, the 401k as much as they can. Well, what's going to happen if HR is good? They catch it, they shut it off. And then for two months, November, December, he's not going to contribute into the 401k plan. If, it, if that 401k plan doesn't have a true up provision, then he's going to miss that 3% match in November and that 3% match in December because he's not contributing 3% of his income. Now, let's just say, for example, you know, the, the participant is making $150,000 per year. Well, he's definitely saving 3% of his income, right? By saving the 27,000, but it's not blended across all of the all of the paychecks. And so he misses that. So 401k plans can have what's called a true up, which goes back at the end of the year and says, all right, who hit, actually hit the 3%? And if they did, let's give them the rest of their match as if <clears throat> they'd participated the full year. A lot of 401k plans, a fairly significant portion of 401k plans don't have that though. The, the administration on that true up is, is just too much. 
And so they don't. And so it's important as an individual and as an investor to understand that, that I want to make sure I'm blending my contributions evenly throughout the year. Okay. Uh, Rex, what's the smallest business that can offer a 401k plan? If you're a small business owner or sole proprietor, can you make your own 401k plan? How does it work? So even the owner of the tan van that's could have that's what I'm talking about. Like, what's, plan. Really, really. Yeah. So what's... so a number of years ago, um, Congress created what's called the the solo 401k plan or the UNIK Uni or what? the individual K or it goes by numerous <laughs> fun nicknames. The UNIK. <laughs> that's my that's my thing. Uh, can I get a UNIK? Yeah. Okay. You can have right. a UNIK okay. unit bomber. So <laughs> oh, no, not that guy. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah. So if you're, if you're a sole proprietor, you or you and your spouse are the only employees of your business, there's no other employees, then you can start up an individual 401k. And, and again, it has all the protections and plan design, you know, kind of, kind of features that you can have with a regular 401k, except for typically the administration is significantly less because we're just dealing with one person. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we can go from one person to, you know, tens of thousands of employees, um, depending upon what we're trying to do with the 401. So that includes like a, an LLC that has two owners and that's it, or three employees total. Like you can do all that. You can, it doesn't just because you can, doesn't mean it always makes sense though. Right. It's, uh -huh. there's still a cost. Okay. And so that's where we get into evaluating to say, is the 401k plan, the best vehicle for what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and, and based upon how much you're trying to save based upon the cost involved with starting up a plan and maintaining a plan over time will determine kind of which direction we would point you. Got you. It just feels like you can save more in a 401k because the limits are higher. You, you can, right. And, and depending upon how you structure that, even though the employee can contribute 20,500 or 27,000 depending upon their age, the employer can also make additional contributions on top of that. And so if you're your own boss and and we set up a unique as is your favorite term. <laughs> I don't know why I like that. Word. Like a unicorn only. Uni, yeah. Unique. I like that. Yeah. The, the unicorn 401k plan. Yeah. So then, then essentially as an employer, if you make enough money, then we could actually put in, you know, up to, do, do you know the limits off the top of your head, Brandon? But it's probably about 58,000 or something like that, that you can put into one of those plans between employee and the employer uh, contributions. So yeah. then you can save a lot. That's the combined. Yeah. Moved, moved up to 61,000. It was down there in the 50s and, and each year it moves up just a little right. bit. So total amount you can save. Any given year, well, this in 2022 is 61,000 before between your employee contributions, profit sharing, employer match, all that stuff has to be less than 61,000. Okay. But that that brings us to a great next topic. Yeah. And that is after tax contributions. Yeah. Um, some some 401k plans can and do allow for after tax contributions. Um, and so you make your full, your first contribution and we do after tax contributions on top of that. Um, and then, you know, typically, and it depends on plan design, right? You got to work with the third party administrator. That's the TPA and, and, and other professionals to make sure we've got all our I's dotted and T's crossed, but you can actually save more in, do conversions and, and different things like that. And so, I mean, you think about that, even if you have a husband and wife working together on a plan, and we can get up to $61,000 per person per year, you can really, with these individual Ks, start to save it a meaningful amount of money really, really fast. And, you know, matching isn't so painful if you don't have any employees. So <laughs> it's yeah. kind of a win. Yeah, Dan, I want to know if, if you have been contributing to a 401k your whole life because you you give, you're from the perspective of where you are nearing or at retirement age. And yeah. so I'm just curious to, you know, from someone who is there, you know, what's it, what's it like to have participated in something like that and to see it grow and watch it grow over time and, and to see the rewards and, and know that now that you, you have some, some of that for retirement. Yeah. So several things I have always contributed 
to a 401k in my at, at our offices uh, at our firm. And then typically we've gotten matches. Uh, we have a decent match um, all the time. And so I've always contributed at least 10% and in some cases up to 15% in the early years of, of my uh, career. I would be disappointed if the, the financial company, a yeah. financial company didn't have a decent match, I guess. Uh, you know, <laughs> that, is, that is a topic of uh, our subject all the time because there are some out there that don't have a match. Uh, yeah. We expect you to save your own money and not okay. worry about what the employer is going to give you. But we, okay. we've always had a match, so that's good. And then what I did is uh, uh, my, uh, my wife, who owns a big dance studio uh, and has mostly part-time employees, but my two daughters help and they work full time. And so we started a 401k for her uh, to start saving some money also uh, four or five years ago. So Dan, it's, it's ballet West nutcracker tryout time. Is, <laughs> is that what the studio is into? It is or? not, it is not but okay, my okay. daughters have been involved in that in years past as Rex's daughters have. Yeah. So one of our, one of our good friends and, and one of my daughter's students made the Clara uh, position for this year this year yeah well we'll have to we'll have so. to chat because uh mine's a soldier oh awesome so, yeah boy they already got the clara out already that's yeah good. yeah okay. so yeah dan that's interesting stuff i'm glad to hear i'm glad to hear you know you you've been able to participate for so long and you've been able yeah. to watch watch it grow i mean how fun is that right to see the investments work it's meaningful it is yeah. uh, dan the, over the key, to, the key to most people though and, and this is I neglected to say this in the beginning. It's great to start with 10%, but don't do that. And then after four or five months say, Oh man, this is more than I thought it was going to be. And then stop contributing the next year. The key to success with a retirement plan is consistently consistency over the years and continuing to contribute at least something, uh, Something like Rex says, a little bit, just a little bit uncomfortable, but yet still a meaningful. And uh, that makes a huge difference if you add those years all together. So consistent, be consistent. Yeah, it's a, when, when we say 10 to 15 percent, one of the mistakes that I see frequently is, is I'll see an employee sit there and say, OK, I'm making, you know, three thousand dollars per pay period. <clears throat> and so. 10%, that's $300. And so they'll write in a fixed dollar amount as opposed to a percentage mm. on, on their contribution. And and the issue with that is it stays $300. They're, they may get a pay raise in six months. They may do overtime or, or their hours may be cut or whatever the case may be. And and they're still at that 300 And so as they continue to get raises and raises and raises, that 10% becomes 8%, 7%, 6%, 5% over time and and because they're not really in tune and not really paying attention they don't make the adjustments over time and so you know we do strongly recommend that typically you do Rex, a percentage we call that spending money oh what a waste <laughs> so i've earned it yeah. <laughs> dan dan what are some of the the biggest mistakes you've seen clients make over the years with 401k plans in your mind out of curiosity? Uh, well, not, not being consistent, first of all, and, and starting it and then backing it off saying, you know, this is going to be a tough year and then not restarting it for five or six or seven years. Um, not putting enough in to get the full match. If, if there's a match of 5%, uh, you should be at least 5%. Or three percent, you should be at least three percent at a very minimum. Um, figure out how to live off your paycheck without that three percent. You've got to get that dollar for dollar match for sure. So that's number two. And the probably the third thing comes into play when they start investing the four hundred one k. Instead of diversifying it uh, properly, they they sometimes will not ask for help from the financial advisor that is there to advise them and help them based on their investment objectives and their risk tolerance. And so uh, how you invest those funds and a proper diversification based on your risk tolerance is very important also. So those three things. I, Rex, I remember I, all I did was ask the people I worked with, what should I, <laughs> what boxes should I invest? You know what I mean? Because 
I didn't know. And I trusted the guys who were a couple years older than me who were like, yeah, you want to do this because you're younger and blah, blah, blah. And who knows if they were right or not, but well, let's talk about more about how to, how to invest and what to invest in as well as what to do. I want to know what to do when you change jobs and how do you keep up on your 401k? But Brandon, do you have some more numbers? You betcha. <laughs> Man, this this has an entirely new meaning to me when I'm in Banyan One. Oh. <laughs> and so because I mean I really feel like I should stick my hands out over the fire and right, <laughs> right. Yeah, we're camping. It's, yeah. it's kind of nice. Rex, yeah. you don't light fires in the camper. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Quick way to die. Um so so I thought this one was interesting. Lenders repossessed twenty thousand seven hundred and fifty properties during the first six months of 2022. That's up 113% from the 9,739 repossessions in the first half of 2021. Um, and Isn't so- there like I mean, a, a renter's mo moratorium or something? You can't keep, you can't keep so this out, of, out of rents, but you can, but you can uh, take their this house. This is defaulting on mortgage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so there was a renter's moratorium during COVID. Renter's moratorium. Um, to where you couldn't kick out uh, a renter. Um, and there was even a short period where, where banks couldn't foreclose on loans during the initial stages of COVID. Um, but that, that obviously expired. And, and so, but, but they, that, but they that's take a your big house. difference, Brandon. Yeah. That's a yeah. big it, difference. Well, and the stat, so the stat was actually given by Adam data solutions, but the reason I point, I bring it up because obviously we are some of the biggest proponents not to rob your 401k, right? Not to pull money out of your 401k. But I remember as, you know, a new getting into this industry and, you know, saving for our first house, young kids, you know, I mean, the whole, the whole thing. And, uh, and I was like, Ooh, do I save for my 401k? And I thought, man, how can I not, right? If I'm going to enrollment meetings and like helping people, I, I just can't not. So I, so I did. And some of my rationale was, Hey, at the end of the day, you know, we can pull money out for a first time home purchase, right? Why, why on earth wouldn't I participate in a match and, and, and just save in the bank? Um, and then the other, the other thought is to it, I would never recommend it. Right. But it is far, a lot of times better to not be foreclosed on, lose your house and take a little bit out of the 401k. And so I feel like that stat is perhaps a really good, um, statistic. The other thing I'd point out too, is with the amount of equity in homes today, people should not have their homes repossessed, right? People let, they get behind, they, they just don't want to think about it. But really, if you're in the position where foreclosure is coming, you can just flip around and sell it and pull $50,000 of equity out of the house and not have a, a you know, foreclosure on your record. That's def definitely a better choice, but obviously there's always unique situations. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Uh, all right. Let's do this. How, how do we invest into the 401ks? How do we build a 401k portfolio? Where do you start? I mean, this is, this is your wheelhouse, right? You guys are financial planners. We, we, <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> Why, yeah. Usually we recommend if you just, so we'll have companies, we'll pull the office and just see who is putting money where. And that's typically where we recommend people just yeah. <laughs> just ask me but make sure they're older i knew i had it right when i was doing it <laughs> and that's what that's what i did yeah so we just kidding about, that's not what to do we talk about common mistakes right and <laughs> and dan dan will attest to this but back back in the day right when we walked uphill both ways in the snow to school um 401k plans would have a default investment they still have what's called a, a qdia or a qualified default investment um account that if you if you don't choose what investments you're going to go into then the 401k and you're still making deposits the 401k has to put your money somewhere and and so every 401k plan has what's called a qdia or a qualified default investment um it, originally those would be the money market fund mm. and and in the mid 80s that seemed like a great solution right because interest rates were at 12, 14, 16%. And so you're getting 12, 14% on your money market inside the 401k plan. As interest rates started to come down and come down and come down and come down, then then that started to become a, a, a big question in a lot of plans. Now may be the time to go back into money market. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> so so but that's so that's it became a source of litigation 
in the 401k industry to where uh, an employee, you know, when interest rates came down to, you know, to 0% or 1% or 2% to extremely low and the company being a fiduciary is supposed to do what's in that participant, that employee's best interest inside of the plan. Mm -hmm. And, and so it became a, a point of contention as to is, is the best place for an employee's money, a money market when it's earning close to zero oh. or zero. But that's <clears throat> impossible to litigate. How are you supposed, every situation's different. What, well, uh, impossible uh, to litigate is difficult, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. and so I, know a lot of attorneys I mean, you can litigate, litigate anything, anything <laughs> but I, but, every, but everyone, every situation is like, how do you come up with a, yeah, I don't know. About so yeah. anyway. we've got an answer for you. Yeah. Go ahead, yes. Rex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so there were a lot of plans that, that lost that lawsuit. Um, and crazy. And got sued and, and, and had to, you know, make up significant funds to their employees yeah. um, for, for placing money in there. And so that kind of changed the environment to where over the years it kind of became a balanced fund. Well, it was a balanced fund for a 65-year-old as appropriate as a balanced fund for a 25-year-old. So, again, we started getting litigation you know, is that, is that really the best place? And, and here the last decade, it's been target date funds and target date means that, you know, if, if Brandon is, I'm, um, you know, 30 years old and he's going to retire when he's 65, then we have 35 years. And so that would put him in a 2055 fund or a 2057 fund that kind of gets more and more conservative as he gets closer to, to that target retirement date. Yeah. Um, Rex, I just want to say that on our last podcast, I made a short of it because your, your quote was so good. You can watch that on our, and, and a reel. So on the Instagram and on the YouTube, but you said it's your money as when you're talking about taking money out of an IRA, like it's your responsibility, it's your money. So when you put money in a 401k, yeah, you can go and you can sue and you can say they did me wrong, but really it's your money and you should probably know what your money is invested into inside your 401k. Am I wrong? Absolutely. You're right. Okay. You know, it is your money and you should take personal responsibility to pay attention to your own dollars. Yeah. If you're not going to pay attention, why should anybody else pay attention? Yeah. Right. And obviously they have legal responsibilities to pay attention, but <laughs> <laughs> so they're, so they're going to pay attention, but, but at the end of the day, it is your money and this is your retirement and this is your life. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's true though. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And it ultimately um, comes down to more of a gen generic, right? A lot of the target date funds now are actually going with a, you know, your target 55, 2055, but then there'll be an aggressive one, a conservative one and a moderate one down the middle. And, you know, ultimately they're just trying to be, you know, as generic as possible. Well, if you're an aggressive investor and you're comfortable with market ups and downs, you might want a little bit more octane in your portfolio, right? You might want, you, you might be comfortable with the ups and downs of the market and, and you're willing to let it move up and down in order to pursue a higher rate of return. And so that's why it's a good idea to, to reach out to the advisor on the plan or, or reach out to, you know, another financial advisor like plan with Baxter. <laughs> but but yeah, well, plan with Baxter's helping us out here today. So this is very good. Brandon, what is, um, what's a defined target date fund? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Target date fund. So that's kind of like what we've been talking about. So it essentially says if you are, if your plan is to retire in the year 2040, this, you choose this fund and it kind of, it's an autopilot, right? And you can look at what's called a glide path. And, and when you're, you know, when you're 30s, you're going to be mostly, you know, equities um, or mostly stocks, the more volatile things that, that historically have had a, a, a higher rate of return. As you get closer to retirement, then, then that we add in more safe money market funds, bond funds, things that are going to be a little bit more safe. Now, I, a lot of times, I mean, the variation on what you actually need when you're 60 years old is, is, is quite substantial, right? It, it's highly dependent on on your your personal financial plan and so many plans not all but many will allow what's called an in-service distribution at age 59 and a half where you can actually roll it out of the 401k hold it in an IRA and then you can select you have a little bit better control of selecting the fund options whereas a 401k typically only has 20 to 40 different options um, and and you can manage out there while still participating in your 401k plan, still getting the match and everything else. And so a lot of times, you know, if it's appropriate, we'll increase the volatility at the 401k plan, right? Increase, you know, how much risk we're taking there so that we get maximized 
dollar cost averaging, meaning you know, you're buying a set amount every month when the market goes up, you buy fewer, when the market goes down, you buy more, and you can really benefit from, from market movements doing that while then managing the bulk of the money in a, in a little bit safer manner. Okay, Brandon, how, what's your recommendation when, um, I think the, well, the term now is quiet quitting. Uh, <laughs> people are, people are changing jobs faster because they're, they're being, um, they're disenchanted with their job over a shorter period of time. In other words, I think, um, I don't know, Rex and I are probably, probably in the camp where people would maybe work, I don't know, four or five, six jobs in their lifetime. Um, whereas Dan, maybe you, you're in the camp where people work two, three, four, five, I don't know. But now it seems like people are changing jobs every two years or something. So, so you start a 401k, can you, can you roll it into your next 401k? How do you, tr you just have all these 401ks out there from all these jobs you worked at? Like, how do you track all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, you can. And, and, and Rex and I and Dan, I'm sure have, have come across cases where, you know, people are like, I know I've, we're still, I'm currently actively trying to track one down, right? And you know, it's, you, they know it's out there. They know they work for it. They're pretty sure they didn't pull it out, but you don't know where it is, right? And 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 you're just calling old employers. You're trying to find where that where that 401k plan is vested. If you've got, you know, I typically more than share that story, right, Brandon? You just went through oh. a, a significant scavenger hunt, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> With, yeah. Employee looking for a pension on this one actually, and they knew they had it, but. I mean, they hadn't received correspondence since I think 19, the 1990s or something. And and so we're just, I mean, we're looking and the company had been sold and resold and the pension got moved and canceled. And we're literally on talking to government entities, finding, you know, the filings for it. And they're like, well, it looks like it disappeared in 1990, whatever. And so anyway, that we found it. We found it, but wow. it was hours, hours wow. of searching. Impressive. For that. Good job, Brandon. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, it's a little bit easier. There. Yes, it was. She'll yeah. find the pension for the rest of her life. That's crazy. Yeah. You know? yeah. And once, yeah. Oh, once we wow. found it right now, we know where it is. We updated the address. We updated all the contact information and now we're good to go on it. But, but it, Rex and I, we had another one where, where the lady got a note, a letter. And I had still to this day have no idea how they found her. But uh, but there was a, a significant chunk of money left in a 401k she didn't even remember. And so the good and the bad is is typically wow. if your balance is more than five thousand dollars. So if you want to leave it in that old 401k, you can do that as long as you're keeping track of it, making sure the investments are good, making sure fees aren't eating it all away. And so I don't know. It, it typically a lot of people will choose to roll those into one central IRA or into their current 401k if they have one. So that's is, that usually, best, is that best methods is to row it all into, into one? And how do you do that? So so it's typically, I mean, best practices is tough. So it depends, right? There's your answer, Brandon. Okay, yeah. So it depends. <laughs> so, I mean, you want to go through, there's a lot of factors that, that go into whether you should leave it or whether you should roll it. And I think we even have a podcast on, should I leave it or roll it? Um, and so you go through the fees, you go through the service, you go through the fund offerings, you go through you know, the, you know, what, what's available to you within the plan um, versus what's available to you outside the plan. And, and that, that does take a little bit of time. And so typically you do want an advisor to, to help you through that. And so it, it is, it is interesting that, you know, if you leave it in an old plan and they make a, a plan change, and so they go from a, a fidelity to a Vanguard or whatever the case may be, right. From company A to company B for servicing the plan and and you're no longer working there and you've moved then two things happen one you probably aren't getting notification that they're making a plan change you probably are no longer going to get access because now the money's no longer at company a and it's a company b so you don't have online access anymore they don't have your current address because you probably moved and so it's very easy to lose track of these different retirement plans and and eventually, a lot of times they end up in the in the state of you know the the forgotten property division, right? Oh, well. The unclaimed property, and so and and that's going to end up in the state of wherever your last address was. And so even though you may have lived in in a certain state for the last twenty five years, well, twenty seven years ago you may have lived somewhere else, and that's the address they have. And so it might be in Alabama, right? And so. <clears throat> So it's, it's easy to lose track of those, which is one of the primary reasons that people will end up consolidating them. Um, back, back to the investments for a second. Uh, you know, 
the other on, on target date funds, not all target date funds are created the same. So just because you're in one set of target date funds at a previous employer, and now you're going to a target date fund at a new employer, some target dates kind of get more conservative as you get close to retirement. And some target dates are through retirement, meaning that they still stay fairly aggressive and they're more geared towards your lifespan. And so just because it, it's a target date, don't assume that you know that path that it's going to follow and that it's going to be on. Make sure that you pay attention to the details and understand how that's going to work as if that's what you end up picking. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's better just to work with an advisor and put together your own allocation that, that fits you based on your age, your risk tolerance and, and what you're willing to do and then have that continually, you know, reviewed over time and adjusted periodically as, as you see fit. All right, Rex, let's, before we end, let's wrap with how do you, we access the cash? What's the in-service distribution and when do we need to, start emptying this thing out here let me rex let me talk for just a second about something that happened uh, to a young couple back in 1982 i think this is important <laughs> that we all remember yeah the spouse was working for a high school and contributed to a 401k and quit the job and got a check in the mail for three or four hundred dollars cashed the check and didn't tell the other spouse about this and a couple of years later, uh, got audited from the IRS because of a 401k that was rolled out and never saw a 1099. And so instead of rolling it from, IR, uh, from the 401k to an IRA, cashed the check and, and went to Nordstrom's. So anyway, uh, keep in mind that this is pre-tax money, that if you do change jobs, uh, you want to roll it to another IRA or into the new employer's 401k plan, or it is a taxable event in most cases. Keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd be amazed at how many. So typically, if you have less than $1,000 in a 401k plan, the company can just cash you out. They'll just send you a check. Oh, wow. And, and so if you're a, a young adult, right, and you've yeah. worked at a company for for a year and all of a sudden you get, you know, you change jobs, you get checked in the mail for $800. You're like, yeah, I'm going to Disneyland or, or wherever I'm going. Right. But they don't take the taxes out of that. So, so typically they don't typically, or it's a small amount and they don't know what your tax rate is. Hmm. Right. And so they may withhold a 10% or a 20% or, and it may be too much. It may be not enough, whatever the case may be. Cause the company doesn't cut the check. The, the holder of the IRA, of the 401k, 401k right the provider yeah holds it okay. right cuts the check and so and and you're no longer employed at the company mm -hmm. right so the company doesn't have any any real interest in yeah in taking care of you at that point necessarily and so you know you have to remember that you will have a 1099 at the end of the year so i i can't tell you how many times we'll see you know somebody come in and say man i got this irs letter saying that i didn't report this income and now they're trying to charge me penalties and fees and it's gone on for seven years. And so now I've got all this interest and, good and it can turn uh, good into news. a headache. Good news. They're going to have more employees. So this process will be much smoother in the future. <laughs> That's just so, so you know. That's true. Yeah. Hey, Less confusion. <laughs> one other thought that I had, Brandon, because you'd brought up, you know, the current generation may change jobs every two years or yeah, so. Yeah. And, and when you think about that and the vesting schedules on these 401ks and, and the compounding of money. So if you're, if you're with a company and you're in a 401k plan and you're contributing and that company's vesting schedule is over five years. And so you leave after two, so you may take 20% or 40%. And then you've got to start over at the new company on your vesting mm -hmm. schedule. So then you're only getting 20 to 40% of that match. And then you start over at a new company. And so how much of that company match are you leaving on the table? You know, job change after job change after job change. Yeah. But you know, like, engineer person they like doing the math they're like okay i'm gonna I, make I, x amount more yeah. at the new company yeah i gotta make you know, this much more money to make it worth it. instead of 17 dollars, i'm gonna make 17.27 oh, and so that 27 cents is gonna <laughs> yeah. yeah so i mean that's typically you know who that's impacting the most and and that really is is where it's having the impact because you have 40 years 40 years of compound interest yeah on that money i mean if you compound you know, a thousand or two thousand or five thousand dollars over over forty years at a good strong rate of return, that turns into a lot of money. Yeah, that's meaningful that you're leaving on the table. And so, one of the things that Warren Buffett would do with his kids 
you know, his kids would come to him and say, Hey dad, I want to buy, you know, this, this baseball bat. Right. And it, and it might be $25 and Warren would sit him down in his gruff little way. And, and he'd sit there and say, now, son, <clears throat> let's look at this bat. This bat is $25. That's my best impression of Warren. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm just really happy you're doing more buffer. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so it's $25. Now let me punch on my, or move my abacus or whatever he was using for a calculator at the time. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in 10 years, this $25 bat, you know, that's, that's $127. Does this bat look like $127 bat? And in 10 years, it's, you know, $350. Is this bat $350? And, and next thing you know, he's out there, you know, with the freaking broomstick playing baseball because he's but not about to buy a baseball bat. You do that same thing with your kids, don't you? Well, I do. <laughs> 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 does it work sometimes yeah 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 sometimes it works sometimes you just really want the thing and it doesn't work but yeah. well and sometimes i just want to have that talk with my kids oh my gosh <laughs> tell me about when we have to get our money out of these things brandon you want to in-service distributions are awesome so dan what's what's your favorite thing about in-service distributions would you say well you're 59 and a half and you're not quite ready to retire and you're saying to yourself you know i've got a lot of money with this company and i only have seven different investment options and i want to have more options and have a, a financial advisor help me with this big portion of what my retirement is going to be you have to know the rules uh, going in and out but you can roll it to an ira and invest it the way you want to and then continue to to get contribute and get the match on the money that's still left there going forward um, but uh, in-service distributions are just a great way to, I think, uh, mentally start to prepare for retirement and to have your own account outside of your 401k, get used to seeing statements and on an IRA. Uh, it, it's just a good way to start that process. There, there's a lot of intricacies surrounding in-service distributions. <clears throat> I was working with with one client here a couple of years ago and and he was a real saver. I mean, he would max out his 401k plan, had for years, very engineering type of mindset. He would also max out the after-tax contributions mm -hmm. that, that Brandon had talked about. And he'd also, you know, do part of the Roth as well. And so he's, he's really plowing some dollars into this. However, because of his 401k plan provider, they, he could do the after-tax contributions, but the plan design was not set up to convert those after-tax contributions into Roth 401k um, contributions, which is one of the the strategies that sometimes we'll do in a 401k plan or in an IRA account. And so we had to work with with him. He was over 59 and a half, matter of fact, barely 59 and a half. And we were able to, to work with the provider to just roll out the after-tax contributions into an IRA account because he didn't have any other IRAs at the time. And we were able to kind of do that backdoor Roth that we talked about on our on our Roth IRA podcast. And, and so this was a huge advantage because it got it into from a tax deferred situation to where we had, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars that was after tax money earning tax deferred growth into a tax free environment to where, you know, the growth on on those couple hundred thousand dollars now is is tax free mm -hmm. because we converted it. And and so but that does get a little bit tricky. And and so it, it really is even even if you think you have it nailed down, sometimes it's sometimes it's a good idea to get a second opinion. So, yeah. Sometimes it's good to maybe plan with Baxter.com. It's good to plan with Baxter. <laughs> One, two, two quick other things too, as far as taking money out, once you turn 72 and obviously that age can get changed from time to time, but right now at age 72, there's a required minimum distribution or sometimes called an RMD where you're required to take a certain amount, amount out of any of the pre-tax assets. So you've got that. But then another common question I get is people are like, all right, so how does this work? Like I'm, I've been saving into this my whole life. How do I pull money out? Um, and oftentimes, right, that's rolled. You can do it from a 401k or roll it like the in service or just after you're done employed, you move the, the money to an IRA. And then we can do that however you want. It's actually really quite flexible. Some clients have a set up a monthly distribution to kind of just replace between that and social security, maybe a pension. It just replaces their income. And just every month we're sending them money. Um, other clients, you know, have that set up and then take one time, you know, distributions when they need it. And so it, it's it's amazing how simple it oftentimes is to move money out of there. 
So what you're saying, Brandon, is it is it's worth it to talk to someone who knows all the rules? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The financial planner, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, man, oh, horror stories. I mean, they're, you know, clients will come in and be like, all right, I'm ready to talk. Whatever you say, I bought my Corvette or I paid off my house or I, you know, did some, took some 100000 or 200000 out of the 401k. They're like, you know what? I just want to pay this off. I don't care if it's smart, not smart. I'm like, Ugh. like now you just launched yourself in the highest tax bracket you'll ever see your whole life for this one year where you took the most money out. If we would have just spread it over two years, like even into, you know, next year, wait right. three months, we could have saved, you know, huge dollar amounts. Well, um, some plans are super restrictive. Like some of the government plans used to be really restrictive. They would only let you take money out four times a year. And so if you did that during January and February, then then come October, Right during the best time of the year, which is Halloween, you, you wouldn't have any money to buy Halloween <laughs> decorations, right? And so, um, but it's some some of those tragedy, plans, it's a tragedy. tragedy, yeah, yeah, true, true, <clears throat> yeah. The the struggle is real. So, <laughs> so I, do you I mean, have wait? There's Rex, no plans do, like do you that. have a Halloween plan in addition to your <laughs> retirement plan? So <clears throat> we. Do we have a Halloween budget? Is that yeah. what you're asking well, me? Well, no, I mean, a, a higher, well, a, a Halloween IRA. I've seen Rex's yeah. account. He does have the Halloween IRA listed. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it's a big, just kidding. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> no one celebrates Halloween like the Baxter family. <laughs> <laughs> no one. So, I love it. So you, you guys make fun of us, but <clears throat> in the past, I've always made my wife wait until um, September 1st before we would put anything up, right? Well, my kids are growing older and getting older. And, and, and so this year we started having a couple of boxes start to start to appear in, in like July, August, August. July. Yeah. July. And, and so, and so one day I go out in my front yard and, and I mean, we have all kinds of decorations. Right. And so I'm, I'm out there mowing the lawn and, and all of a sudden I see, I'm like, man, what happened to one of my kids doll heads? There's this doll head hanging from this tree. Right. And it's just the head, right? Creepy little head, no eyeballs. I mean, just a creepy little head. Right. And I'm like, this is just weird. I don't know if somebody's out here, you know, killing animals or what's going yeah. on, you know? And, and so I come out, you know, and, and I'm like, I, I probably am going to cut that down the next day. I finally get to it. And I'm like, it, it multiplied. I've got like, <laughs> I've got like three heads out here on a tree now, you know, I'm, I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. And so, you know, so anyhow, so for the last couple of months, we just have been having, you know, little items mm -hmm. start to appear mm -hmm. throughout the yard, whether mm -hmm. it's a little clown head or the 12 foot skeleton hanging out over the roof. But I mean, might, might I suggest so. a separate Halloween IRA? Yeah, that yeah. might be a good idea. So just throwing it out there. Yeah. Okay. That is the ultimate 401k plan. I, I'm sure we missed something. So if we did uh, e email Rex, thanks so much for your time, Brandon and Dan. Pleasure having you on the podcast. Plan with Baxter, plan with Baxter.com. You can, anybody can reach out, right? At any yeah. time or just, just absolutely. Email Shoot us an email. You can hit us on the website. Um, you know, we have our contact on from information there. You can do, planwithbaxter.com you can do planwithbaxter at ampf.com is an email address that you can use um, however you want to reach us so yeah. awesome sounds good that is it for this episode of through the pines reminding you to use yesterday's dollars to finance tomorrow's dreams